Well, good evening and welcome to Dome at Home, the Manitoba Museum's planetarium online weekly astronomy show. My name is Scott Young. I'm the planetarium astronomer and I'll be your host for this evening. Thanks for joining us. It's, uh, it's nice to be doing a show on a night where it looks like it's going to be clear. We've got some beautiful skies out there right now, which is fantastic. The uh, last few days have sort of been on and off clouds and with the temperature going up and down and then maybe rain, maybe snow, I haven't really been eager to head outside, but uh, it looks like it'll be good tonight. So that should be good. We will uh, talk a little bit about what you can expect to see in the sky tonight and this week from the area of Manitoba. Of course, most of this is applicable all across the country and anywhere in sort of mid northern latitudes. But uh, we are broadcasting from here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. So that's, uh, that's where the things are set for. This week, we're going to be talking about um, pair of friends, Ginny and Percy, who are up there on Mars. Some uh, really exciting things going on. We've got some other cool space stuff. We've got the evening constellations. We'll be looking at the morning dance of the planets that's going on right now. And uh, yeah, lots of, uh, lots of fun things to look forward to. With me as always is Mike, who is out in the chat land keeping track of everything on social media, keeping track of everything here in our Zoom webinar. I can see the comments that come through on the Zoom webinar and Mike is looking after everything else and moderating uh, all the things out there on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. If you have comments or questions, put them in the chat and uh, either I or Mike will see them and we'll get to them throughout the course of the show. We do have a section at the end of the show where we do Q&A. So if you have sort of specific questions, that need a little bit of an answer, we'll be glad to get to them then. If you just want clarifications about what we're talking about right then, throw them in. And uh, yeah, Mike, I guess uh, we got uh, we got a nice little package in the mail today that uh, maybe you want to tell the viewers about. Well, you know, we all we always love to receive fan mail. Uh, we get it uh, through our email at uh, space at manitobamuseum.ca. It's always nice to hear from our visitors out there, but our, or sorry, our listeners, uh, but it's also really nice to get it uh, via the old fashioned mail system. And uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, a whole bunch of grade five and six students from uh, Ms. Marie's classes uh, at uh, Oakenwald school. They sent us a bunch of uh, nice uh, cards that uh, were written up uh, with some great uh, uh, thanks and uh, some great art, artistic drawings and lots and lots of questions. So uh, we just got them today. We haven't really even had a chance to look through them all, but uh, the next day on uh, YouTube or something, I don't know that they're listening live, but either way, uh, thank you all very much. And we will uh, get back to you on those as soon as we've got the chance to go through them. Excellent. Yeah, that's uh, thanks a lot uh, to Oakenwald. Uh, Miss Murray's class has been watching um, since the beginning and incorporating all of our stuff into their into their uh, classroom. So that's cool. Look, we got George here. He came early, and he you can see how thrilled he is to be on TV or uh, on on YouTube. He's uh, yeah, exactly. I'm not quite sure if he's going to put up with this much longer. But here, Georgie, you can go. Thank you. All right. So we, um, if you want to send us mail, you can uh, do so either through the old fashioned way, or you can hit us up on various social media. There's our email and our Facebook and YouTube links. We're also on Instagram. You can, you'll find us. It's the Manitoba Museum here in Winnipeg. We love to get uh, stuff from all the viewers. So thanks very much for that. All right. The sky. It is, of course, getting darker later in the evening. And so, you know, after the show, the sky won't even be dark enough to really see the stars yet. But what we can do is, oops, there we go. What we can do is, you know, just speed things up to around nine o'clock, things start to get dark enough that we can start to see the various um, constellations. And off in the west where the sky is still pretty bright, those winter constellations are still hanging on. Orion. I don't think you'll see Orion anymore. This is this is Betelgeuse right here in the top part of Orion, but his belt is, I wasn't able to see it the last uh, last time I went out right after sunset because it's just, 
The sky is too bright until Orion disappears below the horizon. We've got Mars still hanging around up here. When we get to the Dance of the Planet section, you'll see why Mars is still, you know, sort of remaining visible in the sky, even as the constellations sink down below. You'll see sort of what's going on there. But again, this part of the sky, we're getting towards the uh, the end of the of the view. In the oops, in the south, we'll just stretch along to here. We have, of course, our springtime constellations. Zoom out a little bit. There we go. Leo the lion, right up here, nice and central in the uh, in the southern sky. Some of the uh, other constellations that we've talked about here is Virgo over here supposedly virgo the maiden doesn't really look like a maiden to me but that's okay um and up above the bright star arcturus in the ice cream cone of boates i know we go over these every week so if you watch the show every week you probably um well maybe you're getting sick of hearing which constellations are where or seeing the same ones but the sky changes fairly slowly and the best way to learn these constellations is to sort of go out and see them over and over again and get that whole sense of of you know what they look like and how big they actually are in the sky like is the big dipper this big across or this big across you can only really tell that when you get out there and and track it down so we do encourage you of course to go out and look at the real sky everything that we see here is all the real thing and so you can go out and find all of these things in the sky over in the east we have our other constellations coming up. Now you notice here's here's Arcturus again with with uh, Boates. It looks like it's sort of tilted over on its side, whereas when we were looking at it from the other part of the sky, it actually looked right side up. Remember, this is the sky isn't a flat screen, and so basically when you use one of these round star maps, you know the the maps that sort of show the whole sky at once, you really can only use part of it at once. And so what you have to do is basically pick the part of the map you're going to use put that horizon down at the bottom and face that direction. And then these are the stars you'll see. So if you look towards the east, you'll actually see Arcturus and Boates rising kind of sideways like this around nine o'clock tonight. You can always track Arcturus down or remember where it is because the Big Dipper helps us find it. The Big Dipper is actually almost straight overhead at this point in, uh, in the early evening. Four stars that make the bowl, followed by another three that make the curved handle. The handle is describes sort of the shape of an arc. And so you can follow the arc to Arcturus. And that's how you remember that one there. So the constellations, like I say, not a whole lot has changed. You'll notice that the moon is not in the sky. We had full moon last week. Some of you might have had a chance. It was cloudy here on the actual night of full moon, but you might have had a chance to see the the full super moon, the, uh, the pink moon. It wasn't actually pink, but uh, apparently the name came from, uh, there's a certain kind of moss that blooms in a certain part of the United States where the people that came up with that name live. And so they call it the pink moon because that's when the ground all turns pink because of this moss. Totally localized, not really relevant to the rest of us, but somehow with the magic of the internet, and uh, probably the far farmer's almanac as well. That particular um, that particular uh, name has perpetuated forwards. Uh, let's see here. We have um, oh, Brooke was asking. Um, I mentioned Mars is hanging around. Mars Mars is hanging around. How long will it be hanging around for? We'll probably be able to see it for another several weeks anyway. But as you'll see, it is it is getting closer and closer to the sun from our point of view. And um, so we are going to lose it fairly soon. But just because of the way the orbits are, are lined up, as all the constellations sink down into the west, Mars actually is moving the other way and it sort of counteracts the motion. So Mars has actually been in that part of the sky in the evening for months now, just because of the way these orbits work out. We'll uh, We'll talk more about that when we get into our our interpretive dance segment. Mike, you're uh, you're getting changed so that you can uh, do the interpretive dance of the planets. Uh, uh, yes, sure. Yes. We'll go with that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, we uh, we won't be doing the interpretive dance, alas. But um, next time, 
maybe we'll uh, we'll set that up. Okay, so we have our constellations. Moon is out of the sky. All of the other action is actually happening in the morning sky in terms of constellations. Now we will start to see some evening planets coming up. We will, in fact, um, be able to start seeing Mars, uh, Mercury, and Venus coming up in the evening sky, but they're a little bit low still this week. I don't. I don't think it'll be pretty tough to see, but they will start to appear. But right now, if you get up in the early morning sky, and we'll just set our time here for, oh, I don't know, five in the morning. Oops, five is too early or too late. Four in the morning. Yeah, let's start there. Set the sky for four in the morning and look off towards the south and the east. Well, there's our moon moving very low in the southern sky, rising just before uh, bef before the uh, sun does, or a little bit before the sun does. But then there's two bright objects over here. And I'll turn off the constellations because at that time of the, the night, you're really starting to lose track of, of what's up there. Here, we'll set this for, say, 4.30. That's when the, the sky is starting to brighten. There we go. So here's 4.30 tomorrow morning. And off in the southeast, we have two planets. We have Jupiter here. And we have Saturn off to its right, quite a bit fainter. You'll probably see Jupiter first and longest. Those two planets, uh, you may remember back in December, were right next to each other. Now they are sort of uh, spreading apart a little bit more, but they finally started getting high enough in the evening sky, or in the morning sky, pardon me, that we have a chance of seeing them. Now they're still not very high. They're still quite low. I find that my neighbor's um, hedge blocks this part of the sky completely. So I can't even see it from my backyard. I have to go somewhere where there's quite a nice um, flat horizon where you don't have too many obstructions. But the cool thing that's going to be happening here, if we just step through 24-hour um, periods, so the, this is tomorrow morning about 4.30. That was the wrong button. That's the next morning. The moon has started moving in closer. We'll zoom in a little bit more so we can maybe see the, the shape of the moon. The moon is, is getting down towards a quarter moon at, the, at, the, at that point. And there's the following nights. And basically each night the moon will move along the horizon sort of underneath these planets. And as it moves each night, it will become a thinner and thinner um, portion of a moon until here we have, uh, let's see, this is on the morning of the 5th at 4.30. We have a nice little crescent moon with Jupiter up above it, just a little bit above it. And let's see if I can fit it all in there. And there's Saturn over there. So that'll be a nice little dance of the planets to see. It's not the same as the December conjunction, but certainly some neat things. And as the moon goes past, it really helps you identify, you know, which planet is which. Um, because basically, uh, you'll be able to take a look at our webpage uh, at manitobamuseum.ca in the in the current sky section. And each day it will say, oh, the, the moon is to the bottom right of Jupiter tonight, things like that. So you can basically use that to figure out which planet is which. Now, why is it that these planets and the moon are all sort of in this part of the sky. And why is it that they're so low in the sky? And why, why don't we have a better view? Well, it turns out that there's some, not really complicated, but some, some motions going on that maybe we're not aware of. I mean, most people that are watching the show probably know that we live on a planet, the Earth. The planet is round and it spins around once a day, and it goes around the sun once a year. That's, that's given. So that means that our viewing point is always changing. So when we look out at the sky, what we see depends on the time of night and the time of year. So that's how all the constellations change. That's how we have the, the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun and all that kind of stuff. When you look at the other planets though, they are also moving as they go around the sun. And so we have to sort of keep track of two planets motions to figure out where something is, our own planet, and then the planet of interest. So I put together a little um, 
explanation here to try and talk a little bit about this. This is like a top view of the solar system right now. Now, the, the dots are not to scale, but the distances from the sun, the orbits of the planets, those are to scale. So um, just keep that in mind. So you've got the sun in the middle there. You've got uh, planet Mercury in green. We've got Venus in white. So we've got, here's us, planet number three from the sun. And then there's Mars. Um, and Joy just actually asked, are all the planets on the same plane? Yeah, almost. And that's part of the part of the point of what's happening here. So remember, we're here on the Earth. And so I'm going to put in a reference line here. Here's where the sun is from the Earth. Now that doesn't necessarily help you too much. It's just a reference point. Because remember, when we're looking towards the sun, it's daytime, right? When we're looking off in this direction, when we're on the side of the Earth facing away, we would see stars because it's nighttime. But we would see certain stars. We would see whatever stars are in this part of the universe around us. We would not see the stars that are over here because the sun's in our way. We can't see it. So even just where the Earth is in its orbit around the sun changes what stars we can see. But the planets, of course, get more complicated here. There's a uh, a line out to Venus, and then there's one out to Mercury there, you see that those lines are at a pretty small angle. They're, uh, there we go. They're not really, you know, very far apart. We're looking kind of in the same direction right now as the sun, if we want to see Mercury and Venus. Now that's always kind of true. Mercury doesn't really get that far from the sun. It's, it's close to the sun, but right now the angle is pretty small and that makes it hard for us to see it. Mars, on the other hand, the angle is well, maybe not quite 90 degrees. It's certainly 60 degrees or something like that. And so we can look quite far away from the sun. After the sun goes down, Mars will still be up in the sky. And that's what we see, basically. Mars is in the evening sky because this angle away from the sun in this top view is reasonably large. And this works for the outer planets as well. Here we've shrunk down the solar system so that the, the inner solar system is all in that box there. And then here are the outer planets. I'm putting the same sun reference line in there. That's from the Earth through the sun. So that tells us what direction the sun is, even though you can't see them in that box there. And then there's our line to Jupiter and Saturn. Again, this angle is pretty reasonable. Like that's actually, that's very similar to what the angle was for Mars on the other side over here. So you would think that with Jupiter and Saturn being reasonably far away from the sun, they should be easy to see. There's uh, Uranus up there. It's actually right in the same direction as the sun right now. And then there's uh, Neptune. So you would think that just from this top view that it's pretty easy to see those uh, planets. Now, obviously, there's more complication here, so we'll get to that in a second. Let's move forward a little bit. This is a month later. You might remember that the Earth was over here originally, and a month later or so, we've moved partway around the Sun. And these other planets have also moved. Mercury has moved almost halfway around its orbit. Venus has moved, uh, you know, part of the way. Mars has moved part of the way as well. And so if we put in, that was our original Sun line. That was the, the reference point. That was the direction that the sun was in before. And now the sun is in that direction. So the sun has moved in our sky by that angle. You don't have to worry too much about the details here. Um, because I, I'm just kind of demonstrating the fact that as things move around and change, we get these different views. There's Mercury. Mercury has actually moved quite a bit from our point of view. Venus used to be in that direction. Now it's in that direction. In fact, almost in the same direction as Mercury. Mars used to be in that direction and now it's in that direction. So Mars hasn't moved as much. Mars is an outer planet. It's, it moves slower. So it, it only went about that far. Mercury went literally almost halfway around in the same time period. And of course the Earth moved as well. So for the inner solar system, all these things moving around means that the planets change pretty, pretty often. The outer solar system, though, there's our old sun reference. There's our new sun reference a month later. The other ones, well, there's Jupiter where it used to be, and there's Jupiter now. Hasn't moved that much. 
here's Saturn where it used to be. And Saturn now, it's pretty much in the exact same spot. The outer planets move so slowly that they really don't, like in the case of, a, in the course of a month, they don't move much at all. Actually, what really moves is just the Earth. And that's our, that's what accounts for most of the, the motions there. So basically, as we go, the, the farther planets from the sun will move less than the inner planets do over the course of a period of time, say a month or whatever. So how does that relate to what we actually see in the sky? Well, we're going to put up the orbits of the planets as if we could just draw them in the sky. This is the inside view, the side view essentially of the solar system. The other one was the top with all the circles. Now we're in one of those circles. We're on the blue dot in one of the circles. And all the other circles are mostly in the same plane, as Joy was saying. Um, most of the planets of the solar system are actually in the same plane or, or pretty close to it. The moon is plus or minus five degrees um, from the solar system. That's, a, that's still pretty close. So this means basically that all of these planets move throughout this area of the sky. And that area of the sky is called the ecliptic, and it goes through the constellations called the zodiac. So that's where those zodiac constellations come from. Those are the ones that we can see planets in or see the moon in. It turns out, though, that the, the angle of the ecliptic, the zodiac, is basically tilted compared to the angle of the Earth. So basically, you wind up having um, like the North Star, for example, is always in the same spot. The ecliptic is not always in the same spot. At different times of the year, the ecliptic can be sort of at a shallow angle, like it is out to the horizon that doesn't get very high, or it could be at a very, or, or it could be at a very steep angle. So all of this to say, the planets as they move around will lap each other, come close to each other, pass each other and so on. The moon will pass them as it goes around the earth once a month, but it'll all happen in this sort of racetrack area um, in the ecliptic. And the, the ecliptic or the zodiac is this band across the sky. In the morning right now, the ecliptic planet or the ecliptic plane is at a low angle. So even, even though Jupiter here is quite far away from the sun. The sun is way down here. It's still going at an angle like this, so it doesn't get very high above the ground. If the sun was here and the ecliptic was at a higher angle, Jupiter would be way up here somewhere and it'd be way easier to see. So that's why we don't have a great view of Jupiter and Saturn right now. And it generally turns out that in the morning sky, the ecliptic will be one angle and in the evening sky, it'll be the opposite. So actually right now, if we were to just go back to our evening sky here, let's go back to nine o'clock. 8.30 is fine. 8.30 in the evening sky. And let's, uh, there we go. There's the same, there's the orbits of the planets and it's at a much steeper angle. So for example, when Mercury and Venus start coming around away from the sun, Mercury doesn't get very far from the sun. This is Mercury's orbit. That's literally as far as it can get from the sun. So if it happened to be that the ecliptic was at a shallow angle, Mercury would only be out about here and we'd hardly see it. But things right now are positioned so that when Mercury gets farthest from the sun, the angle is higher, it'll be nice and easy to see. And we'll be able to basically watch Mercury and Venus come um, up into the sky and we'll start to be able to see those planets coming up in the evening, uh, coming up over the next couple of weeks. It's actually pretty cool to go out and look at these planets and see them over time, see how they move, and then sort of think about that whole all the circles and everything going around the sun and so on. It's uh, it's a pretty complicated system. And yet people were able to figure it out just by observing using the same tools 
that you and I have in our backyard. You can actually figure out and prove all this to yourself if you're if you're interested in the math to um, verify that yes, we are in a planet going around the sun and that all these other planets are going around in the different orbits and so on. All of that just using eyes and brains. That's, uh, that's what astronomers do. Okay, we had a bunch of questions fly by here that looked like they were related. Uh, Mike, do you have any questions that were sort of right on the dance of the planets target here? Uh, yeah, um, I'm just trying to figure out which ones you'd be able to answer easily enough. Uh, for example, we got a question about how long does it take other planets to move around the sun? I don't know if you want to, you want to try to tackle yeah. that. It's, uh, yeah, of course, it's that. different for every planet. So, yeah, yeah. Each, each planet takes a different amount of time. Mercury, I think is about 77 days to go around once. Venus is about 200. We're 365 days, of course. These are all Earth days, by the way. We're, we've got to use a standard somehow. Mars is a couple of years. Jupiter's, I think, 13. Saturn's 30. And then it gets to Uranus is, what, 80? Neptune's around 140. I think those are the numbers. Those two I'd have to check. Don't, uh, don't quote me on those. And then Pluto is 220. So, I mean, you get this much longer period because basically gravity is a, is a force and the closer you are, the more gravity there is. That, so that means basically the closer planets have to move faster. Otherwise, gravity would just pull them into the sun and they wouldn't be sort of balanced against gravity. We'll, uh, we'll throw that up onto the, uh, onto the, uh, the page so that you can uh, see all the numbers. Okay. Uh, and Brooke is asking a really good question about why we cannot see planets or never see planets in the northern sky. Oh, yeah, that is a good question. Let's uh, let's pop back to our sky here. So if we just zoom out a little bit and we'll go to this whole round view of the sky and we're going to face towards the south. There we go. So... Here's the zenith, the point right overhead. Here's the northern horizon way up at the top of the screen. The ecliptic basically is, it, you can think of it kind of like an equator. It's not exactly like an equator, but it's, it's kind of more in the central area. It doesn't go near the poles. The angle between um, the ecliptic and sort of the normal uh, east-west line is only 22 and a half degrees. So that's only a tiny little tilt. And so that means that this angle just never tilts far enough away from east-west to, to put any planets way up here. All of them can only be basically 22 and a half degrees away from the east-west equator line. And so that's, that's why we don't see any planets up in, the, up in the Big Dipper, for example. I mean, if the Big Dipper was a zodiac constellation, it'd be great. It, everybody could find it and so on, but it just never happens. Now, if you lived on another planet where the tilt of the planet is more extreme, like on, say, Uranus, in Uranus, the planet's tilt is, is more than 90 degrees. The North Pole actually sticks out the side and the bottom a little bit. There, you would have a completely different situation. You would be able to see planets in the north or in the south or all over the sky because the tilt is so great. Okay. Let's... Um, um, can you, uh, we, just I one more quick talk. question, Scott? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, just a, a quick question. Uh, Ryan was asking, what planets can you see with the naked eye and which do you need binoculars or a telescope to see? Ah, well, good question. So the, the five um, planets you can easily see with the unaided eye are Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Well, and the Earth, I guess. You live there, so that, technically that's six. Now, the outer planets, the farther ones out, were not discovered until the invention of the telescope. It turns out that Uranus is technically visible to the unaided eye if you know exactly where to look in advance and you have a perfect star map because it basically looks like the faintest star that you can possibly see on the darkest night and it just looks like a star. So it's no surprise that they kind of missed that one. Technically, you can see it. I personally have only ever seen it in binoculars or a telescope. Neptune is right at the limit of binoculars um, you really need a telescope for that one. So that's sort of the, the range of visibility of the planets. And uh, of course, then there's lots more fainter things, Pluto, asteroids, and that kind of stuff that you, you definitely need a telescope for. Okay, I did see a number of questions about, um, uh, let's see, China's space station and things like that. I saw a bunch of things go by. So I think it's time for us to head over and get some cool space stuff in. Cool. 
Vista! So we've been talking a lot about one particular planet and not every planet is getting the same amount of love. So I thought we'd actually start with Jupiter today because we were talking about Jupiter in the morning sky. We have a spacecraft at Jupiter called Juno. It's been in orbit for a number of years and it goes through these long looping orbits and it's taking these amazing pictures. And it, its primary mission finishes up this year and uh, they just extended the mission to start doing some more things. But it's sending back pictures like this. The, the clouds of the gas giant planet Jupiter, all these beautiful swirls and, and amazing things to see. There's the great red spot is just rotating out of the field of view up here. But then there's a bunch of little white spots here. And you can actually see the detail. They're basically tornadoes or, or hurricanes. There's storms in the clouds of Jupiter. Um, just amazing views. And some of these... Like this is a real picture of the clouds of Jupiter, one of those one of those storms. And it looks almost like the weather pictures we have here on Earth in terms of the detail. I think I'm gonna print this one on, put it on my wall. It just looks like a piece of artwork. This is, uh, this is amazing. And these pictures are coming back every day from Juno and they're kind of not getting the, you know, the, the press anymore because Juno has been there for a little while. It's made some discoveries and, and now it's, on to the next new thing, right? But a lot of these spacecraft work so hard and the people that work with them work so hard for years afterwards to bring these pictures back. This is kind of a cool one. Here's Jupiter and here's the Earth to the same scale um, with a, a blow up view. This is the Northern Lights on Jupiter. And here are the Northern Lights on Earth. Now they're different. Uh, the northern lights on Earth can be seen with the unaided eye sometimes. The northern lights on Jupiter are actually in ultraviolet light, so our eyes cannot see them, but the cameras can. But it's amazing. You've got, you know, two completely different kinds of planets, different distances from the sun. One's made out of rocks and one's made out of clouds. And yet they both have the same, basically the same situation going on with their northern lights. There's a lot of similarities here. And so I just think it's cool to see Northern Lights on another planet. So this is a, just a schematic, but basically Juno has finished its mission of looking at Jupiter. Its prime mission is finishing up this year. It's now been extended and it's going to start doing a lot of flybys of Jupiter's moons. We weren't expecting that. This was really to learn about Jupiter itself. Um, but the moons, of course, are really exciting. Ganymede and Europa there are two giant ice moons that have underground oceans of liquid water. There's more water on Europa under the ice than there is um, water on the planet Earth. Like we're talking huge reservoirs of water. Is there life in that ocean? There totally could be. We, we don't know. Hopefully these, uh, these will help refine the, the the next plans for exploring these other other places I've, I've when i do the programs for kids they always want to know about where is their life and things like that and i've i've come to think that uh you know europa ganymede callisto those moons of jupiter in those oceans i think there's something maybe it's bacteria only or plankton maybe it's shrimp like those tiny ones that live at the bottom of the ocean by the by the hydrothermal vents the volcanoes Maybe it's space squid. I don't know. I think it'd be really cool to, to be space squid, but um, we won't know until we get there. Maybe it's dragons, Lucy said. Yeah, you, you know, it's, it's hard to say what life on another world will look like. Um, I hope we recognize it and I hope we find out uh, what it looks like. Okay, a big surprise yesterday, although not a complete surprise, China has launched the first module of its new space station. The Tianhe module, uh, which means Heavenly Harmony, is the very first module of a space station that they'll be orbiting. Now, the space program in China has been very active of late. They just in the last, I guess, uh, six or seven years went from only being able to launch satellites to putting people in orbit and then doing spacewalks and building a small space station to test out technologies and building a cargo ship for their space station and and doing all sorts of things well here is the Tianhe space station for those of you that remember uh, i guess a couple of weeks ago when we talked about space stations there was that certain particular shape that most of the early russian space stations looked like well there it is again 
kind of um, there's a certain efficiency to that design. Now I, I have to say the Chinese version has taken quite a bit of um, advancement beyond that. They've they've added a whole another section at the bottom. They've got this multiple docking port where you can have different modules connect on like Lego. So it's uh, it's going to be pretty cool. This is what the final thing will be looking like. And it, I mean, it doesn't look totally different than the International Space Station. It's got the big solar panels and it's got modules in different directions and little spaceships that come in to bring in astronauts or so on. This is quite a bit smaller. Um, it's, you know, the, the habitable volume is probably a quarter or less of the International Space Station. But they're also going to do it in two years, they said. Um, whereas the International Space Station has taken, well, it's still not technically finished. To be honest, there's still a module that needs to get attached. So um, they're working pretty hard and getting quite efficient. Now it's it's too bad that um, you know there's in some ways this competition, unofficial competition, where you've got um, you know different countries doing their own thing rather than working together. But at the same time, I mean, th sometimes having that uh, second way of doing things can bring some good stuff so anyway we'll watch for that it'll be pretty cool uh we won't be able to see this one from manitoba the orbit is is such that it just isn't going to be visible for us and it'd be quite a bit fainter than the international space station um because it's quite a bit smaller you can get up and see the international space station in the mornings right now you can visit our webpage and and uh, all the times are there uh, so you can definitely go up to do that and uh, oh, before we before we move on, also um, SpaceX launched 60 more Starlink satellites uh, yes uh, today, and if you get up at three in the morning tomorrow morning, you will see them appear in the constellation of Cassiopeia, sort of all in, all appearing in a big stream and then heading down towards the horizon. I hope it's clear because that'll be really cool. I'm going to try and uh, try and catch that and uh, see what we can see. Okay, Mars. People are asking about the Ingenuity helicopter, Ginny for short. Percy, or the Perseverance rover. Well, Ginny had her third flight uh, yesterday, and we had a pretty good view of it. And here's a picture taken from the uh, helicopter. And you can see right in the center top there, that's the landing point where the rover landed, those two white areas. That's where the rockets sort of pushed away all the dust as it was landing. And then way over in the left corner, there's an unusual looking rock. Oh, wait, that's not a rock. That's the Perseverance rover. This is the first picture uh, of one robot by the Ingenuity helicopter, the first image by a, a helicopter on another planet which is pretty cool. Um, and of course, uh, Percy took lots of pictures of Ingenuity as well. Ingenuity is down oh, right there by the Manitoba Museum logo in the bottom left. And as this sequence goes on, you'll see the rotors start to spin up and it lifts up into the air. It went up about five meters on its third flight. And then it flew about 50 meters sideways, sort of flying off here. And it actually flies out of frame, disappears for, um, a few seconds because they didn't have the camera tracking it. The uh, There's no way for the camera to automatically track it. And because of the delay, you can't just have someone with a joystick sort of moving the camera manually. Um, you'd think they'd be able to predict that and get some different pictures. But they were, I mean, they were focusing on the helicopter flight, not, not just taking the pictures. But then uh, Ginny will pop back into frame. Oh, there she is on the right-hand side, basically fly back and then land almost exactly in the same spot. So pretty good navigating by this robot. And remember, the robot is basically doing all of the navigation and steering and everything by itself. Nobody is flying this thing. They basically say, go from here to here. And that's basically everything else the robot figures out itself. Oops. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so... We are going to uh, head to the Q&A section here. I know that there's lots of uh, Q&A. And, a. and um, let's get some questions here. Mike, what have you got coming up that, uh, that we can go through? Yeah, let's, um, let's start with uh, the Chinese space station uh, because we've had uh, somebody curious to know 
why is China building its own space station? That's it's probably a little bit of a tough answer to give, but um, I think it's it's a valid one. So you want to yeah. chime in on that? Yeah, well, it's it's interesting. China as a as a nation has always been big in self reliance and not um, necessarily partnering with other nations all that often. I think there are also security concerns and issues. I mean, if you have your own space station, you can do whatever you want with it and you don't have to worry about what other people are thinking or, or things like that. Um, there's a very close connection between the Chinese space program and the Chinese military. And so there's some thoughts that maybe there would be like some secret stuff in the space station or something like that. So they don't want to share it. Um, it's really a political thing. Um, the International Space Station came about at a time when countries that had been enemies for decades were all coming together and thinking, okay, let's do something together. Let's show what we can do as humanity instead of as these individual countries. China wasn't really a part of that at the time. And so now they've decided again to sort of go their own way. So um, it's, like I say, it's perhaps unfortunate, but having two space stations up there is better than having one space station up there. I think so. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's, let's, um, let's throw things over to Facebook for one of the uh, questions that came in. Uh, Michelle is asking, have they darkened those Starlink satellites uh, so as to not affect uh, astronomers and other uh, night sky enthusiasts? You know, they actually have um, the original. The so these satellites, are quite bright and they have solar panels on them and so when you when they go over the first time you see 60 dots following each other across the sky it's pretty cool the second time it's pretty cool the hundredth time because you're an astronomer out there trying to take pictures of the sky and these things keep getting in your way not so cool so the brightness of them has been a problem SpaceX has been working to reduce the brightness. They've also been, um, you know, everything from changing the way that they they um, spread them, them out in their orbits and things like that. So they have apparently gotten a little better. Once they get to their orbiting, um, their regular altitude, they're pretty faint. And while there's still a problem for professional astronomers, they're not as much of a problem for the average person like you and me. Like imagine if you're out trying to find the Big Dipper and then suddenly there are 60 extra stars, the brightness of the Big Dipper that are moving. How are you gonna, how are you gonna find your way around, right? It, it, it gets pretty complicated. So they have gotten better. I'm still not 100% convinced that, they're, um, that they've solved the problem completely though. Okay, let's, let's get back to planets. Uh, lots of questions coming in about planets. Uh, one is asking, why has the red spot on Jupiter been going on for more than 400 years? Well, that's a good question. Um, the weather on Jupiter, um, I mean, Jupiter is basically made of clouds, made of atmosphere. And so there's a lot of energy in that atmosphere and a lot of wind current and things like that. So I think you get the, the, the uh, situation that once the wind gets going in a certain way, there's nothing to change it. There's no mountains that the wind sort of goes up against and, and breaks its path. There's no oceans where you have heating or things like that. And so I think you can get these long, stable kinds of, of weather patterns. Also, Jupiter is spinning really, really fast. It spins in less than 10 hours and it's a giant planet. So it's basically orbiting so quickly that the winds just get whipped up that way as well. So um, all of that to say, we don't really know why other than it is a very long lived storm and it seems that there's nothing that has stopped it. Now it has faded away a little bit. It has gotten smaller in historical times, you know, since 400 years ago. Right now it's actually only about half as big as it used to be. So maybe we will see it fade away, but at this rate, you know, it's probably going to be around for another few hundred years anyway. Okay, um, let's go to uh, let's go to Vivian's question. She is asking, how big in light years is our solar system, and what is the solar system like when you get past Pluto and the Kuiper Belt? Oh, okay. Hey, Vivian, nice to nice to hear from you. Vivian's been watching us since uh, well since before Dome at Home, I think, when we were just doing independent things. So nice to nice to say hi. Um, so the solar system isn't even one light year across. Like we think the solar system is this massive thing. And it is, it's massive and full of empty space. 
but it's only about eight hours, eight light hours across. So not light years, light hours. So that's roughly the distance that it is. If you went beyond Neptune, beyond Pluto, and out into the very outer edges, into the Kuiper belts where there's all these icy asteroids, and then even farther, something called the Oort cloud, which is like a big swarm of comets and small icy snowballs that orbit around, that's about one light year away. So I guess if you, if you wanted to include all that, you could say the solar system is... Uh, has a radius of about one light year. The nearest other star is about four light years. And then most of them are dozens or hundreds or thousands of light years away. Space is big. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't know. Do we want to start to wrap things up or do you want to take a couple more? Scott, what's your... Uh, what's one your more? Uh, I'm, I'm notorious for running overtime here. So if we don't get to all the questions, we can... Uh, try and uh, answer some more on social media and things afterwards. But uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's do one more here. Okay. Uh, let's go for, actually, I like this question because I think it hasn't been touched upon in any of our episodes. Uh, so if the sun weren't in the way and we looked up in the daytime, would we see the constellations of the opposite seasons? Yes. In fact, you would. And uh, I know this because on those rare times when the moon moves in front of the sun and we get what's called a total solar eclipse, you can see bright stars and planets in the sky in daytime. It's just the moon has blocked out the, the light of the sun. This, the sky gets uh, fainter. And yeah, you can see those constellations. And in, and in fact, here in the, uh, in, the, well, in the planetarium, but also here, we can... Uh, we can actually just turn off the atmosphere of the of the earth there we go and suddenly you can see stars and things like that in the daytime so the really the sun completely influences what we can see in the sky and it it pretty much blocks out our view of half the universe at any given time if you could remove that effect we would see the all the other constellations. So right now the sun is sort of um, over in, which constellation is it in? Over just below Taurus kind of thing. Taurus is disappearing into the sun's glare, but those stars are still there. And so, yeah, you get rid of the sun, you can see all that stuff. And, and Lucy points out, yeah, you shouldn't turn off the atmosphere in real life though. Yes, I agree. Luckily, they don't trust me with anything that has that kind of effect. Uh, I think I would be a terrible supervillain because I would absolutely press buttons just to see what happens. That's, you know, it's curious, you know, what can, what can you do? All right. So uh, next week we will be taking a tour of bright stars. The, you know, the, if you're in the city or even in the suburbs, sometimes all you can see are the brighter stars, but there's a lot of variety among those little points of light. So we're going to take a look at them. We're going to see everything from uh, super giants to dwarf stars. We're going to see multiple stars, variable stars that change their size. And we're going to tour around with the bright stars. And of course, we'll follow in with uh, what Ingenuity is doing and what's happening on the Chinese space station. They're going to be launching a crew for that soon. And everything else that's coming up in the sky. The, uh, there is a meteor shower coming up on May the 5th in the morning. To be honest, it's not going to be a super uh, crazy one, but check that out. We'll have our calendar up uh, on the Manitoba Museum webpage, and that'll give you all the details. Send us mail. Keep in touch. Uh, Scott, have a, sorry. Can I just yeah. quickly interrupt. I just want to mention to our regular Zoom viewers uh, that uh, because we are going to our first May episode, uh, you will need to re-register uh, for uh, Dome at Home. Uh, the links are on our webpage. And I'll put that up in the chat right now. But uh, as of this episode, uh, the link that you've been using for the past few weeks will no longer uh, be uh, valid. And of course, for our Facebook and YouTube viewers, the same uh, uh, accounts will still uh, get you access to the Dome at Home. But Zoom folks, you'll need to uh, re-register. And actually, Mike, if you could uh, if you could pop that Zoom link into... Uh... Facebook and YouTube as well. I had uh, my friend Boris was uh, trying to get a hold of me to see how he could get in on the Zoom. If you want to be in, in on the Zoom, you just it's free. You just have to register. And uh, so Mike will put that link out so that uh, you can join us that way. And uh, it's kind of nice to uh, 
it's it's hard for us to monitor all of the social media feeds and everything at once. So basically, when I'm running the show, I'm just looking at uh, what we have here on Zoom, and then Mike is taking care of all the other social media feeds. So if you want to join us, sign up. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. I'm going to get set to go outside in, uh, in a little while and take a look at the sky. I encourage you to do the same while we have these clear skies. Okay. Enjoy the evening. Have a great night.